Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is a great turnout. Um, we're very happy to welcome Jeff Kupo here tonight. He's going to be talking about the history of Oak Ridge Park. Uh, so I hope you enjoy this tonight's presentation and learn a lot. Uh, please welcome Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Um, I do have a few versions of the slides over there at the end if anybody wants to grab some and some pamphlets just before I forget. Um, and can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, I have a loud voice. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you all for coming out today. Um, let me just keep track of time here. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the history of Oak Ridge Park um, and the surrounding Ashbrook Swamp. Uh, 13,000 years of history right in our backyards. Um, I'm kind of turned around in this building, but I think it's <laughs> just up the, the creek there. Um, so, uh, I'm Jeff Kupo, as Aaron said. I am a librarian by trade. I uh, work in adult services at Elizabeth Public Library. I'm a member of the Metuchen Edison Historical Society, and I am the founder of the Friends of the Oak Ridge and Ashbrook Historic Sites. Uh, our Gmail is there in case you guys want to reach out with any questions about the, the project, the presentation, uh, you name it. Um, we have a Facebook group. Feel free to take a picture if you want to uh, sign up for that later. Um, and that's our nice little logo. Um, so the agenda tonight, uh, if we have enough time, I am cramming quite a few thousand years into one hour. Uh, so we might have to trim somebody. But uh, the plan is uh, talking a little bit about uh, where we're talking about and what we're talking about with uh, geography and geology. Um, the first figures we'll be talking about are Sasha Mkweramek, uh, Kanakamak, Thingarawis, and Kapatamine, the Lenape from the area. Uh, next, we'll have um, the first slave on the site named Phoebe. Uh, we'll be looking at a few um, black patriots from the revolution, uh, Private Oliver Cromwell, Cujo Baquante, uh, Stacy Williams. Uh, we'll touch briefly on Isabel uh, Hartsorn, uh, who lived at the uh, uh, on, at the park. Uh, perhaps not in the farmhouse that's there, but we'll get into that. Um, and then, lastly, uh, a couple of conductors on the Underground Railroad that were active in the area. And um, we'll conclude with a little story on the the message rock that's at the site. Ah, uh, so. Before we get too far into it, I want to talk about kind of where my focus is uh, and what I'm doing here <laughs> and why I'm doing it. So um, there was a great uh, local historian um, from Bergen County named Kevin, Kevin Wright, and he has this quote that I really like, and it's, history holds a mirror to human nature, its possibilities and imperfections. And I, I really like that. It sums it up perfectly, at least for me, um, that history... A lot of people view it as a source of pride, and it is a source of pride. Um, but you can't just look at its, you know, our successes in our past. You have to look at our failures too. I, I think history is about problem solving. We all know the old quote, you know, those who don't learn from uh, history are doomed to repeat it. Um, the past it really creates the present, right? Everything that's happened has led us up to this point now. All the, the decisions, actions of our um, ancestors um, have brought us to this point. Um, so it's up to us in the present to learn from that to create a better future. Um, I also think history is not just about memorizing dates. It's about understanding people. It's about connecting with people and learning their stories and looking at a life with all their actions and choices and decisions all stacked up from beginning to end. Um, I like local history because it, it shows us the, the stories that are literally right under our feet. Um, that we don't often know about and that it's up to, you know, dedicated local historians working for free, working on passion uh, to teach us about. Um, otherwise, it would all go, go uh, overshadowed by our George Washingtons and our Abraham Lincolns. Um, given that my interest is in, tends to be underrepresented people, um, those that are whitewashed out of history often, so our women, uh, black people, indigenous people. Um, so those are a lot of the stories that I'm focused on tonight. Um, I do think all of these people that I will talk about are as important as our George Washingtons and our Abraham Lincolns, because um, everybody, everybody in this land, you know, from now back to the founding and before, 
have created where our society we're in now, our circumstances that we're in now. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm going for. Um, but before I go too deep into it, I wanted to give a few special thanks because this is not all me. This is decades of work uh, that is uh, gonna be shown to you tonight. Um, so extensive, extensive past work. And he's cool enough to come out tonight. Uh, Bill Federski, who has spent 30 years battling and trying to get this story out there. Um, Walter Stokel from the Metuchen Edison uh, Historical Society has done a ton of great work on the Battle of Short Hills. That's Short Hills, Plainfield, Edison, that area, not the, the Short Hills, the town. And Brian Toll, also from the uh, Clark Historical Society. Um, a lot of people helping out recently, Jan uh, Janice Stavenick from the uh, Plainfield Friends, Rick Gefkin and Dr. Rich uh, Veet from Monmouth County, Dave Bierman from uh, the Scotch Plains Historical Society, and um, the other dedicated members of uh, my friends group, Nick Cruz, Nikki Mason, Ali Blumenfeld, and of course I cannot forget <laughs> Aaron and Megan and the Clark Public Library for bringing me here today. So without further ado, uh, let's talk about some geography. So this is our area of interest. Uh, we have at the focal point uh, Oak Ridge Park, uh, as well as the Ashbrook Reservation and the Ashbrook Golf Course, um, as well as the surrounding neighborhoods, mm, going out maybe a mile, mile two, um, all kind of surrounding this central swamp and the, the heights around it. Um, so the Lenape camps will talk about kind of extend north towards the Shaka Maxon Golf Course. The Battle of Short Hills kind of goes west towards the Plainfield Country Club. Um, the farm that was at Oak Ridge extended down Lake Ave um, quite a ways uh, where Locust Grove Road is now, you know, that kind of area. Um, it is uh, originally known as Ashbrook Swamp or Ash Swamp. Uh, the Lenape called it Tomaquess. Um, it is in modern day Clark Scotch Plains and Edison. Uh, historically, it was in <laughs> a variety of towns as they've evolved over time. Uh, Clark originally being part of Rahway, uh, Edison originally being, or this portion of Edison being part of Woodbridge. Um, so we'll touch briefly on that. All uh, right, so jumping back a few thousand years, yeah, a few thousand years. Uh, Lenape Hoking. Um, so the Lenape, before any colonists came here, uh, this was their homeland. Um, it's broken up into two broad areas. That light green at the top is the, the Muncie territory. Um, the two darker greens, there's a debate on um, the language there, uh, whether it was two languages or not, but for the purposes of this, we're calling them the Unapi, or the Unami Lenape. And again, the top is the Muncie. We're mostly talking about the Muncie. That's the Hackensack, the uh, Navasink, the Raritan, the Minisink, um, they all kind of have uh, roots in um, the Oak Ridge Park area. Uh, at the point of contact when the Dutch get here, it probably is Unami territory, the Sanhekans. Um, the Raritans actually came from the New York City area and, and chased them out uh, around 1630. All right. But the d dividing line is generally the Raritan River. Then we have New Netherlands, uh, 1614 to 1674. Um, reaching out into this area, uh, largely focused on the, the Hudson though, um, but uh, the Dutch were poking around the area. Um, Tomaquest, the name for the swamp, is, uh, has its roots in the Lenape word for beaver. Um, beavers were uh, really important for the fur trade, where the colonists down in Virginia were looking for gold. Up here they were looking for furs, uh, soft gold, they called it, um, very lucrative. And back in the 17th century, uh, the native nations were really as powerful as the, the Europeans were. They would go toe-to-toe -to -toe them in fights. Um, and there was really a lot of nations vying to control uh, this slave uh, fur trade. And it's just a, a fascinating time that we don't really talk about. We kind of skip straight to the revolution. Um, so I know I said history isn't about dates, um, but I just want to kind of go through um, the progression of ownership that led to the Oak Ridge Swamp. Um, I'll touch on most of these just briefly. So Henry Hudson was 1609, sailing for the Dutch. Uh, like I said, New Netherlands comes in around 1614. 
1664, March specifically, King Charles II, uh, he gives his brother James, the Duke of York, uh, New Netherlands, despite it not belonging to England, <laughs> uh, or really the Dutch for that matter, but the Dutch controlled it. Um, so then James, wanting to take his prize, uh, sends a fleet under Colonel Richard Nich Nichols uh, to take it from the Dutch. So Nichols sets sail in May. Now, while J Nichols is sailing, uh, James gives half of New Jersey to two guys, uh, Sir George Carteret and to Lord Barclay. These are the Lord's proprietor. Uh, by the time Nichols gets there, these guys already technically own the place. Nichols takes over without firing a shot. He lets the Elizabethtown Associates buy the Elizabethtown track, which is this huge track. I'll show you on the next page. I'll show you now. Um, it's big. Um, it's kind of in the middle there. Um, so along the Raritan River, pretty far into the New Jersey. Um, so he, give, he lets them buy that. That'll be a problem later. <laughs> um, Ashbrook Swamp, uh, Oak Ridge Park, that's included in that. Probably sold by the Sasham uh, Quarimac. And then we got a little bit of progression. You know, uh, Philip Carteret, George's cousin, he's governor. The Second Anglo-Dutch War ends, and that's when the English technically really get New Netherlands. Um, before that, they were just holding it hostage. The Dutch take it back for a year, splits into East and West Jersey. And this is when the Ashbrook Swamp is then sold a second time in 1677, uh, sold to the Carterets uh, by Kanakamak, Thingarawas, and Kapatamine. Uh, Deputy Governor Thomas Rudgard, a bit corrupt, gives himself the best land, including what is now Oak Ridge Park. Um, he has it for a bit, passes through his family, uh, and eventually it's sold to the Smith family in 1696. So, uh, just to highlight a couple things, again, um, Oak Ridge Park, uh, Ashbrook Swamp, it was owned uh, by the Elizabethtown Associates and George Carteret at the same time, two rival governments, and sold twice by the Lenape. That's funny now, but it'll be even funnier later. Uh, <laughs> so these are the two tracks um, that uh, we're talking about that are, have been sold that include the Ashbrook Swamp area. So like I said, the Elizabeth Town track you can see on the left, um, sold in 1664. On the right, you have uh, what I'm calling the Tomaquest track. It's not just Tomaquest. It's just that little part at the top. But uh, that's what we care about. Uh, <laughs> so there it is. Um, so I told you before, the town situation, a little confusing. I don't want to belabor this point, but originally where we are standing now was Elizabeth. Um, the western fields of Elizabeth uh, became its own thing around 1720. That became Westfield eventually. Uh, Rahway for a little bit was called Spanktown because the one of the first colonists spanked his wife and I guess that was big news. Uh, <laughs> Bridgetown for a little bit, even though back then they were still calling, calling it Rahway, Rawak. Um, Rahway became officially Rahway in 1804 and then Clark seceded in 1864. Uh, Scotch Plains has kind of always been Scotch Plains except for a little bit where they decided it was Fanwood and then it was Scotch Plains again. Um, Middlesex County, a little less convoluted, except for the fact uh, Edison was Piscataway for a bit. Uh, where I live in Edison actually was where <laughs> Piscataway started. But most of Edison in this general area we're talking about was Woodbridge. Um, broke away as Raritan and then became Edison. Um, I don't want to get too much into this, but I wanted to include it in the slides. Like I said, the slides are, I have 10 copies of the slides over there, but if anybody afterwards uh, shoots me an email, I'll give you the, the slides, the whole kit and caboodle, so you can uh, take a peek at that if you like. Okay, one last thing with geog ge uh, geology, not geography. So 20,000 years ago, uh, all this that we are on right now was under a lot of ice. Uh, as was moch, most of northern, um, the un northern United States. Um, it actually ended right about here. So those short hills in Plainfield and Edison, those are the edge of the glacier, basically, because it had pushed all those rocks up. Um, and on the other side of those rocks, you have this little bit of a hollow, right, because it's carving up. 
and that becomes Ashbrook Swamp. It actually was a lake for a bit, a big glacial lake that drained. But we're talking, you know, 13,000 years ago, it, the glacier had kind of moved out of New Jersey, so this has always been kind of wetlands. Um, there's this great map showing the old coastline in the south um, during the Crea Cretaceous period, and then mapping um, like voting statistics on top of it, and the coastline from the Cretaceous period with the dinosaurs tends to vote Democrat. <laughs> um, because the coastline, it was very rich um, during the you know, uh, plantation era. That's where people wanted to farm. So there was a higher concentration of plantations and thus a higher concentration of black Americans in modern time who tend to vote uh, Democrat, uh, Democrat, at least in that area. So you, you look, geology millions of years ago impacts our present day. So like I said, the, the past creates the present and the deep past does too. Um, I also want to note, not too relevant for this, but look at that, look at that coastline of New Jersey, how far that went out. That's how, how low the, the ocean level was. Really crazy. All right. So let's talk about the indigenous folk here. Um, before them, uh, while it was still the Ice Age, just want to touch on our Mastodon friend. Um, so the glacier was receding about 13,000 years ago. Um, the first people in New Jersey were called the Clovis. It's this really widespread culture across the United States. Uh, big game hunters. They made these real distinctive spear points. Um, and they would hunt mammoths and stuff. Um, they first found them in New Mexico, Clovis, New Mexico. But they were over here in Jersey, uh, sometimes hunting mammoths and rain mastodon. But in Jersey, mostly smaller game, reindeer, giant beavers. Um, like I said, the, the swamp was always a swamp. It was nice, rich, fertile, wet land. It grew some nice forests. Uh, mastodon, unlike the woolly mammoths, woolly mammoths eat grass, mastodon eat trees. Uh, so a mastodon, you know, 12,000 years ago, munching on some trees in an Oak Ridge Park, uh, lost a tooth, as you do when you eat wood. Um, and Charles Philhauer, the renowned Lenape expert, um, from earlier in the 20th century, uh, found it one day with his Boy Scout troop. Um, so there's no evidence of the Clovis at the site, um, but I wouldn't be surprised with more archeological work that they might turn up. Uh, again, this is fertile land that people have for centuries found enticing, um, so I am assume they would too. Mastodon go stink extinct 10,500 years ago. 500 years ago, humans move in. So the first people that would have lived in Oak Ridge Park and the swamp to the north um, and on the highlands on the other side of that swamp, uh, so like I said, Shackamax and Golf Club, that area, those neighborhoods, um, they would have moved in in the uh, early Archaic period, so 8,000 to 6,000 years ago. Uh, the, let's see, do I have a map? I can't talk about exact locations because the State Historic Preservation Office um, doesn't want looting. Um, but um, this general area is where you have the, the oldest sites. sites. Um, you have um, two still in the, oops, daisy. Uh, two still in the swamp, two hills. Uh, these are public record, you can know about these. Um, so there's a police academy the hill behind that was one of the village sites. And then uh, a little bit deeper in the swamp, right behind uh, the Union County building, or the Union County College building, is uh, it's called Red Hill. Um, there's a hiking trail that actually goes around it. And it's high, um, not down in the swamp. I've hiked in the swamp. Don't hike in the swamp. It's not fun. Uh, <laughs> so um, that's where people were living. Those two hills I mentioned, those were more um, late archaic, so 4,000 to 2,000 years ago. Um, in that period, they started eating a lot more grains, wild grains and shellfish, and you had a population boom. So that might explain why we see a lot more evidence of them in that period. Uh, pottery makes it to New Jersey in 1000 BC. I know it's weird to think of uh, people uh, not having pottery, but pottery is an invention. It's a technology, and it has to spread around. Um, so that begins the woodland period, which lasts until the contact with the Europeans. Um, this is when the cultures begin to differentiate. 
This is when you see the Munsee Unami divide, not just different languages, but different tools, different burial practices. Um, corn comes to New Jersey, uh, 500 to 1000 AD. Prior to that, they were eating a lot of sunflowers. Um, there's a kind of crop that's like quinoa that people were eating. But corn allows people to move towards agriculture. Very productive agriculture, actually. Corn's amazing. Um, uh, and you have a lot of population growth and development of religion and ceremonial life and all that. So this is um, that western hill behind the uh, police academy in the swamp. Um, this one's also pretty easy to get to. It's higher and drier if you wanted to poke around. The trail starts right behind the police academy. And this is only, uh, you know, 500 feet into the woods along a trail. So it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty manageable in case anybody wants to give it a shot. Um, and it's, it's uh, last time I was there in the summer, it was pretty well tended, you know, not overgrown or anything. Um, okay, I want to talk about the Great Mini Sink Trail real quick. Um, it's one of the biggest features of the Lenape inhabitation of the Ashbrook Swamp. It's about 75 miles long as the crow flies. Uh, it connects uh, the Unami and the Muncie peoples. It crosses the Navasink. Raritan and Delaware River, starting down in the Navasink Highlands and runs up all the way to Minisink Island in the Delaware. Um, very long trail. It's the largest uh, Lenape trail in New Jersey. Uh, the Sandhill Indians from uh, Monmouth County are actually trying to get the whole trail on the National Historic uh, Registry, which is really neat to see. Um, so this is the Tomaquist track again. Um, just going briefly on what it contains. So it starts at Kent's Neck um, in the Raritan, which is a little bit west of Sayreville. Uh, it goes up the Raritan, uh, then goes back across Bound Brook, or the Brown Brook, the Bound Brook, the, the waterway, um, into the Dismal Swamp in South Plainfield, that kind of area. Um, it then goes up to a place called Matokshining, uh, which you'll note sounds awfully like Metuchen, um, and probably where Metuchen came from. That's the short hills, probably. Um, and then finally up to Tomaquis, and then back down around to Ken's Neck. So there's a guy named John Worth who's involved in, or he gives a deposition in the big argument between the Elizabethtown Associates and the Lord's Proprietary, the whole land argument. Um, and he says that the Tomaquis tract is bounded on the east by the Minisink Trail. And we know the Minisink Trail crosses the Raritan at Kent's Neck. So it basically runs along um, the eastern portion of Oak Ridge Park. Um, and if I had to guess, uh, it would probably cross the, the river at um, Lake Ave now, if you wanted to walk a bit at that. So this is where uh, I think my favorite part of this whole talk is going to be uh, Lenape land sales. Um, so there's this myth. A uh, very pervasive myth is that um, the indigenous people were suckers, basically. They were naive, they didn't understand land and the European concept of property and money, and that's why they were tricked and so, you know, lost so much land. Um, I think a really good example of that myth is the um, whole Manhattan was sold for $24 worth of beads thing. Um, that didn't necessarily happen. Um, there's no actual record of that land sale. Uh, there's just some dude who wrote a letter at the time that said Manhattan was bought for 60 guilders, which is $1,000 today. Um, but, you know, we don't know if he knows what he was talking about. Um, but where I think it's really interesting is not so much in Manhattan, uh, but on Staten Island. Uh, there's a Sashem named Matano. Uh, if you're familiar with the Elizabeth area, there is a Matano Park in Elizabeth. Um, he, he was one of the sellers of the Elizabeth Town Track. Um, he was the Sashem of Staten Island and Nyack in Brooklyn. Um, in 1652, um, he and some other of the Nyack Sashems want to sell uh, Flatbush to a guy named uh, Van Verkhoven, uh, one of the Dutch people. Now, the director general at the time of New Netherlands, uh, Stuyvesant, uh, hates Van Verkhoven doesn't like him, doesn't want to see him succeed. Um, so he's like, no, 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 this can't happen. We already bought this piece of flat bush from the Lenape, 
uh, you can't sell it again. We own it. And Matano and his, his uh, colleagues are like, no, 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 we, you, didn't, you didn't pay it. <laughs> uh, so we're going to sell it to this guy. Uh, by the way, you know, um, some of your colonists just wound up dead. Wink, wink. Maybe uh, pay us the money. <laughs> um, Stuyvesant doesn't want to pay any money. He doesn't want to encourage the killing of colonists. He doesn't want to encourage warfare. He thinks this will just incentivize more bloodshed. Um, but he doesn't want more bloodshed. Bad for business. The Dutch like business at this period. Um, so eventually, he gives in. He pays Matano again, second time, for this piece of flat bush. Um, <laughs> so then Matano sells it to von Verkoven <laughs> anyway. Uh, so that's three sales. He then sells it sells the piece of it uh, a fourth time to the English, not even the Dutch. Um, so <laughs> he's gotten four sales out of this. Von Verkoven includes a clause in his deed that the Lenape have to move out of Nyack. They got to go back to Staten Island. Um, and they're like, yes, yes, sure, sure. We signed the deal. Give us the money. And then 25 years later, they're, they're still there. Um, so you see this all through Muncie territory. It's not just Matano. He's just a, a great example of it. Um, but they sell the same piece of land multiple times to rivals, rival colonists, rival groups, the English or the Dutch. Um, they sell neighboring pieces of land with unclear boundaries. They sell little pieces of land through land that's already been sold that splits it up, also with unclear boundaries. Um, Matano goes around selling all like the Raritan Bay to, to Stuyvesant's rivals, um, to the English. Uh, and to the point where Stuyvesant's like <laughs> practically begging him on hands and knees to stop selling the land because um, it's making him look bad. <laughs> um, they incentivize these sometimes with the threat of war. Um, now, sometimes this would put the Lenape in com uh, conflict with each other, but most of the times it would leave the colonists arguing for decades. Um, they would have to court the Lenape leaders to try to get them to side with them. They'd have to give them gifts. We'd have to keep paying for pieces of land over and over and over again. Um, this would slow occupation in all these territories because nobody could tell whose it was. Um, it let the Lenape have agency on who got to live in their land. Um, and I think this is, this is fascinating because we talk about, you know, like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse who, who fought off the, the, white, uh, the white man, the Europeans. Um, you talk about like the Cherokee um, who, you know, tried to assimilate and use the law and, and, you know, the written language to try to um, keep their agency and their sovereignty. But you never learn about, you know, them using the land sales against the Europeans. Um, now, this probably was to try to tip the balance, you know, try to gain the upper hand um, and possibly retake their lands. Um, the Iroquois, for example, did very well and lasted, you know, a couple centuries by gaming the system, you know, using trade properly, allying properly. Um, and um, it probably just did not work in the Lenape's case. Um, good strategy. Um, it, it didn't pan out. But what I think is pretty nifty is, like I said, Tomaquis was sold twice. Uh, Ashbrook Swamp, Oak Ridge Park, it was sold twice. Again, starting in 1664. Um, with the Elizabethtown tract. Um, there are a few people that signed, Matano, for example, Oratoms, actually, no, Pierwim, and uh, Warrenanko, you might have heard, Warrenanko Park. Um, but there was a young guy, uh, an Asashem from Navasink and Raritan country named Quaramek, um, who seems like the most likely because he signs on as a witness in the second sale in 17, 1677. Um, so this time, the Lenape sell the land, same piece of land, to the proprietary government. Um, three guys this time, uh, Kapatamin, uh, and two brothers, Kanakamak and Thingarawis. Uh, Quaramek signs as a witness, like I said, as did uh, a gentleman by the name of Emeris, who is listed as the Sashem of the Nevisinks. Um, so like I said, the proprietary government, the associates, they're involved in a really bitter land dispute with each other. It goes on to the mid 18th century, at least a um, hundred years of <laughs> bickering. Um, in between 1664 and 1677, um, John Worth, the guy I mentioned before, the deposition that talked about the Minisink Trail, uh, he talks about when he was young, 
um, the Lenape in the Woodbridge Piscataway area um, threatened warfare. And in the Woodbridge meeting records, uh, you see them buying a bunch of lead and gunpowder in uh, 1671. In 1675, they freak out again and build a wall around their prison uh, as a fortress. No uh, attack ever happened, as far as we know. Um, but they sold it again. <laughs> um, and they got money again. Um, but here's the big reveal. Quirimek, um is Matano's uncle. Uh, Kanakamak and Thingarawis are Matano's brothers. Ameris is his, his dad. Uh, so it's this whole family, this whole dynasty that's calling the shots from you know, New York City, through the Raritan River, down into Monmouth County, into Sandy Hook, um, deep into you know, interior New Jersey with the Elizabethtown Purchase. Um, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, and I think more research needs to be done on this. This should be a book. But uh, Kapatamine, the odd one out, uh, he's Hackensack, um, but he has affiliations with the family. They sell the Newark tract together, for example. Um, Quirimek, um and Kanakamak, they likely died during the uh, a 1684 malaria epidemic. Um, a lot of the Lenape leadership just goes missing from the records. Um, you know, 1682, 1684. Um, and there was a malaria epidemic that year. Um, by the time the homestead building, the, the farmhouse that was originally at Oak Ridge Park, by the time that was built, uh, the Lenape pop population had plummeted. So this is 1720, 1740. There's 1,000 Muncie left in all in North Jersey uh, and almost 100,000 uh, Europeans. But like I said, at Nyack, even though the Lenape were supposed to leave after they sold it to von Verhoeven, uh, they stayed. And we actually do know that a Sashem named Matochin, um, he remained in Matochining as late as 1720. So this is 40 years after the Tomaquist tract was sold, after Matochining was sold. Um, he's still kicking around the area. Um, so who knows, maybe some of uh, this family remained on site for a few more decades. All right, how we doing? All right, on time. So next, we're going to talk about Phoebe. So um, there's a few bits of uh, evidence, three pieces of evidence, um, pointing to slavery at Oak Ridge Park. Um, Oak Ridge Park uh, was originally the homestead plantation. Um, in the 1800s, it became Oak Ridge Farm, hence the name. Um, Homestead Plantation was built by uh, a Quaker named Shubal Smith. Um, and um, afterwards, the Hartshorns married into the Smith family, uh, followed by the Bounds and the Robinsons. So that's the whole chain of people living, living on the site. Uh, so the first piece of evidence for slavery at the homestead is oral history from the tenant family, f farmer family. Uh, those are the Fagans. Uh, they lived right at that little bend where Oak Ridge and Feather Bend uh, Lane is. Uh, you can look through the woods uh, right along the sidewalk. You can see uh, some of the brickwork from their cottage. Um, so uh, the matriarch of that family was um, on site at 1833. Census shows that there were no enslaved people there as of 1840. Um, but the Fagans said that the Bound family uh, told them that residents of the plantation did enslave people. They said that the slaves had a cabin in the woods and uh, pointed that out to a local historian in the 30s. Um, they said the burial ground was across Oak Ridge Road. That's the burial ground for the enslaved workers. Um, so this general neighborhood, um, it is now under houses or a pool. Um, but if anybody knows anybody out there, we'd love to talk to them and see if, you know, we could poke around. Um, now, Phoebe was sold uh, by Schubel, the guy who built the homestead uh, plantation. He was, she was sold by Schubel to a Samuel Smith in 1717. Uh, Schubel had a dad named Samuel. Schubel also had a half-brother named Samuel. Um, so I'm not sure who it is. I would bet probably his dad. Um, but there's the original text of the sale, um, and she is sold for 50 pounds. 
Um, and that's a lot of what we know in primary sources about Phoebe. Uh, but there's a bit we can infer that we'll get to in a bit. The last piece of evidence about slavery um, on the site is a letter from Catherine Haynes, who marries uh, Richard Hartshorn. Richard Hartshorn had married Isabel, that's Schubel's granddaughter. Um, Isabel is Richard's second wife. Catherine is his third right wife. Uh, Isabel passes away in 1793. Um, while Isabel uh, seems to have a kind heart, she leaves all her, or she leaves a portion of her will for the education of poor children, specifically poor black children. Um, Catherine uh, writes uh, a few years before she gets married how she is trying all she can to buy a little black girl. Um, she's not on the site yet, but I think mm, it's a speculation, but I think a person like that is going to keep trying. Um, heavy stuff, heavy stuff. Um, so Phoebe. So the year before Schubel sells Phoebe, he gets married. Um, and locates uh, to a farm that, at the article at the time in 1888, I believe it was, uh, to the property now of George Hartsorn. So the family that owned Oak Ridge Park, it originally was a much larger piece of land. It's basically all of Oak Ridge Park. Um, and then I drew out the locust grove section of the, the farm there. Um, it was eventually subdivided by um, later people in the family. Uh, Richard's children, I believe. Richard Hartshorn's children split it up. Um, so um, one crop, I mentioned Thomas Rudyard, the deputy governor that gave himself the best pieces of land. And one of the things he liked about this swamp is that salt hay grows there. Um, he considered a very lucrative commodity because it was a good source of food for his or for livestock during the winter. Um, he adds, though, that there's a trade-off to this lucrative commodity: is those that live on property that have salt health hay tend to have poor health because they're living in swamps. There's mosquitoes. There's disease. Um, so it seems that Schubel set up shop in the locust grove section. There's kind of two heights on the south, southern, the southern side of Oak Ridge Park. One is where the Oak Ridge farmhouse is right now in the parking lot. You can see it. Um, the other is in this Locust Grove section. So it seems like he set up shop there, built a temporary cabin as one did back then to kind of um, set up shop while you, you build your main house. Um, so even though Phoebe probably, who hadn't been sold yet, was in the Locust Grove area living, all that salt hay you can see from this map where all the swamp is, is in Oak Ridge Park. So she would have walked to the probably eastern portion of the park to harvest the hay if she was, you know, working for the family. Um, another thing to add, that winter between 1716 when Schubel moves there and 1717 when he sh sells Phoebe, the winter is called the Great Snow, or the, there was the Great Snow that winter of 1717. Um, it was the worst winter in three centuries in New England, like 20 feet of snow in some spots. Um, I presume it <laughs> if New England was buried under snow, uh, New Jersey, which is not that far away, also would have uh, not fared too well. So you have Phoebe probably working in the swamp, probably getting all these diseases from mosquitoes, trudging through the snow during that really bad winter, um, and it's, it's, it paints a picture. So, Phoebe is sold by Schubel for 50 pounds, which is double the average ra uh, rate for a slave during that period. Um, my speculation, perhaps, is that her, uh, Schubel sells the slave to Daddy. You know, Daddy gives him a good price to help him build his house. Um, that house there, incidentally, I should mention, um, it's in that parking lot in Oak Ridge Park. You can see it. You can walk around it. It's, it's impressive. Um, it's possible that the western wing, uh, the one on the left side of the picture, is where the original colonial farmhouse was. I don't know if we can be certain. I've heard competing things. Um, but that's, that's, that's possibly where she may have set foot. Uh, the s lower picture is that eastern portion of Oak Ridge Park in the general ver vicinity where I think she would have um, walked around. Um, so it's possible Schubel sold her to help pay for the house. 
Um, the house, like I said, was probably built 1720 to 1740, so the timing checks out. Um, in his will, Schubel actually gives his son uh, 50 pounds if he's to lose his land. So you might think that's what Schubel considered the house worth. Um, another theory uh, that we've, we've considered is that Phoebe might have been uh, pregnant uh, when Schubel sold her and thus got a higher amount because you're, you're selling two people basically, as awful as that is. Um, and you can look at the will of Samuel Smith, uh, Samuel the father of Schubel. Um, his brother, no, no evidence of anything. But his father does have a, an enslaved person in his will, a, a girl named Jenny, also called Ginny, um, valued at $20 and given to his wife. Um, so it, it's possible, um, since Phoebe isn't there, maybe Phoebe passed away, maybe this is a, uh, Phoebe's child, it's Phoebe's child, is there a father left behind at Oak Ridge Park? It, it leaves a lot of questions, um, and we're still digging. All of this is ongoing research, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, it's dark, but I, I think Phoebe especially, out of all the figures in this um, presentation, I would like to be better known. Lastly, um, is the slave cabin. I'll just briefly go on this. Um, so the Fagans, like I said, they mentioned that there was a cabin that the slaves lived at. Um, there was a local historian, Grimstead, who talked to the Fagans and he drew a map of where it was. We also found a couple maps from the 1860s that have a pathway going to nothing, um, except where we found that cabin. Uh, you'll note on this picture there, I think this is the 1862 one, um, you see all those little black boxes for the farm buildings. You can see the pathway, but there's no little black box at the end of the pathway. Um, but that's exactly where we found the cabin. Um, it's also on higher ground in the, in the swamp where you might expect it. Uh, we did find something there, um, as did um, Mr. Federsky uh, early on, um, a couple, couple years back. Um, there is an 80-year tree growing up from under the, the foundation stones we found. Um, and that matches with, in the 1940s, the trees had been cut back in the area. Um, so that would mean that the cabin would date to when Grimstead was there. Um, and if the Fagans were talking about that, they already thought it was old. So whatever is there is, is, is quite old. Um, Dr. Veet, um, the renowned archaeologist from the state, is uh, looking to investigate, so it's very exciting. Um, so this is a picture of it. Hopefully it comes up not too blurry. Um, so we found a 12 by 12 square of um, what appear to be foundation stones, um, th three large stones on each side. Um, it's comparable in size to Washington's cabins at Valley Forge. Um, and as Mr. Federsky pointed out, that it, it does bear a resemblance to the Freedman cabins from Skunk Hollow and Alpine. Um, beyond the western wall is a circle of um, smaller stones, seven by seven. We suspect that might have been the hearth. Um, Dr. Veet pointed out that cabins typically face south. The hearth would be on the east or west side, which would match the cabin. So it's very cool. Um, more work to f come. We, we do want to start excavating, but we, we need the, the county's city go ahead first. So hopefully not too long, but um, we are looking to get down in there. We are working with the NAACP of Elizabeth, too. Um, we don't want to do anything um, that they don't support and endorse um, because, you know, we shouldn't be we ca calling the shots. I think the, the local black community should be um, the ones that make decisions about such a significant place. All right. So, some black patriots from the revolution, Private Oliver Cromwell, Cujo Baquante, and Stacy Williams. So war comes to the homestead in December of 1776. Um, some grenadiers, uh, Hessian grenadiers, are marching to take New Brunswick from uh, the rebels, the, the continental patriots. Um, they would have passed by the homestead. Newspaper articles report a couple weeks later that a Hessian officer had either raped Isabel or attempted to rape Isabel Smith. Um, again, that is the, the lady who had left money in her will um, for the education of children. Um, her father storms in, shoots the Hessian, the Hessians shoot William back. 
Um, he's wounded, but he, he does survive. Um, and that, that inflames New Jerseyans against the, the British. Um, it was n not as we think, you know, it was pretty well split between who was siding with the British and who was siding with the, um, the Patriots. Um, about a third were Patriots, about a third were Loyalists, about a third were like, you don't care, just don't burn our house down. Um, so, um, but this, this, this changes that ratio, probably. Um, a month later, uh, Washington sets up a defensive line from Rahway down to Princeton. He's holed up in the Wachungs. Um, the British are down around Perth Amboy, Staten Island. Um, there are two skirmishes in the beginning of 1777 um, around Ashbrook Swamp. Uh, one on the south end, another on the northeast corner. Uh, but the big deal, 1777, June 26th, the British fake a retreat to uh, Staten Island. Washington comes chasing. The British's plan to basically catch him in a pincher. Uh, march one group around the swamp and uh, get between him and the Wachungs and the other group coming up from the bottom. Uh, what they wind up doing is just sending everybody in New Jersey right at the Ash Swamp, Ashbrook Swamp, Oak Ridge Park, just <laughs> marching right at it. It is one of the largest engagements of the war, the first one in which our flag flew. Um, really heavy fighting, really brutal. Uh, it mostly, it started at Oak Ridge Pond, uh, oh, uh, Oak Tree Pond, not Oak Ridge, Oak Tree Pond uh, off Oak Tree Road, a uh, small skirmish, and then worked its way up to the big shebang, the big fight at uh, the Plainfield Country Club, uh, the hills there. Um, heavy fighting, the, the commander of the Patriots, he had his horse shot out from under him. Uh, the general of two of the, the Patriots we're going to talk about, uh, he was almost captured. Um, but they held out long enough for Washington to get back up to Wachungs. Um, the Patriots then retreated through the swamp. They knew the area. They've been hanging out there for a while um, to slow the British advance down. The British are quite angry um, about how things went. Um, huge loss, huge loss. And they wind up plundering and burning Scotch Plains, Westfield, before all of them, <laughs> every single one, uh, leave the state. So there were thousands of, of black soldiers on both sides of the war. Um, around the time of the Battle of Short Hills, they make up 4% of Washington's army. By the end of the war, it's, it's doubled. Despite that, we only know of about 25, 40 um, black New Jerseyan soldiers. But three of them, we know, at least three of them, were at the Battle of Short Hills. Uh, we got 26-year-old Oliver Cromwell of the 2nd New Jersey, 63-year-old uh, Cujo Baquanti of the 3rd New Jersey. He was a substitute. And 35-year-old Stacy Williams from the 6th Pennsylvania. Uh, Cromwell, fascinating life. Um, he's, he crosses the Delaware with Washington. He sees the last guy fall at Yorktown. He's in it the whole war. Very proud of, of um, his accomplishments and his service to the nation. Um, Cromwell was at the swamp um, at least by April, possibly earlier, um, and he was there until the battle. Um, this is the von Wangenheim map um, showing the layout of the troops. You can see that um, the rebel or the yeah the rebel encampment, the Patriots, were on Raritan Road, basically, kind of maybe where it hits Rahway Road, that general vicinity. Um, if he was there that early, he may have been involved in those earlier skirmishes. Um, but Quante might have been stationed at the swamp um, as early as Cromwell, perhaps before. Uh, Williams was the latest. He enlisted in April um, and probably wasn't stationed um, in the area until the battle. Um, Washington wanted to stick more guys there, but it's a swamp. You can only fit so many troops there. All right. Um, so many black soldiers were promised freedom by the Patriots after the war. Uh, that was not always the case. Uh, Baquante, for example, um, went back to, to Newark in bondage after the war. Uh, interestingly, he probably was a member of the Akan royal family. Um, he had been enslaved in Africa, um, probably becoming a, a prisoner of war, as was common. Um, so he goes back as a slave. Um, Cromwell was free. He was born free. He was mixed race. Um, when he applied for his pension in 1820, though, he's, he's got $10 to his name. Um, some kitchenware, some furniture, the clothes he's wearing. 
He's, he's old, he's unable to work, his daughter has disabilities, he's t caring for her. Um, like I said, he's very proud of his service, but he has to hand over his discharge papers, signed by George Washington. He has to hand them over to get his pension, um, also his merit badge. Um, but people remember him as a kind old man in his later years. He would tip his hat while he sat on his porch to anybody who passed by. Um, up until 2022, he, he did lie in an unmarked grave. Um, there actually is an on Oliver Cromwell Historical Society uh, down in Burlington County um, to try to make his, his um, him more well known. Williams, very similar story as Cromwell. Um, laborer tries to get his pension in 1818, seven dollars to his name. Um, poor health. He was wounded at the Battle of Brandywine. He was at Valley Forge. Um, that probably did not help his, his health situation. Um, but Bequante, despite all his hardships, um, cards stacked against him, becomes very successful uh, selling exotic plants in Newark um, to the upper class there. Um, very well known. Uh, they used his, his, his business as a landmark on a lot of deeds. Um, and in, by 1821, he was uh, one of the wealthiest black men in the nation. Um, he was the first uh, black business in Newark and possibly in New Jersey. Uh, I want to touch briefly on Isabel. Um, research uh, is just really getting started with her, but um, her money did go to build a school. Um, it's in Rahway on 261 Central Ave. You can go take a look. It's um, currently owned and supported by the Ebenezer AME Church. Um, built in 1844, closes in the mid-1880s, um, averaged about 35 students a year. But it is uh, really something to go stand there, you know, at the doorstep and picture, you know, the kids, the parents that were there, you know, over the decades and, you know, the hopes and dreams. And it's just, it's a powerful place to be. Um, so I encourage um, people to go check it out and support the church um, to uh, refurbish the school. I want to talk quickly about uh, Reverend Oliver and Reverend Garnett. Um, so Rahway was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Possibly the most important route in New Jersey was running through Rahway. Um, there was a conductor named Reverend Thomas Clement Oliver. He and his father would travel through Rahway. Uh, he would stop here, t uh, again here, Clark was part of Rahway at the time. Um, he would stop here to get fresh horses from a gentleman named Joseph Garrison. Um, Southern Clark, below Lake Avenue, uh, was known as Quaker Town. That's where a lot of the Quakers lived. And Oliver and his father would typically rely on free blacks and uh, Quakers to make his way north. Um, so this is the logical spot for him to stop. Um, he grew up on a Quaker farm, attended Quaker school. Uh, he recounts uh, how his career began at the age of seven. He was at a church gathering and a slave chaser, or uh, slave catcher turned up. And the, the crowd started beating, beating the guy up. And little seven-year-old Thomas wanted to help out. Uh, so, so he finds a big stick and hands it to a man to help beat up the slave catcher. Um, that continues through his career. He says he started um, in earnest as soon as he could drive a horse, so probably the 1830s. Um, once near Mount Holly, he was escaping with a family north, and two wagons of slave catchers started chasing him. Um, so he and his, his guys get out. They run a clothesline across the road. They trip the horses on the first wagon. They stick a bunch of poles through the wheels to break them. They tie the guys up. They take their guns. They ambush the second wagon. Uh, they put the family on the second wagon, and they make it successfully up north. And I really love in his interview, he says he never saw anything done prettier. Um, really, really amazing guy. Um, he continues with his work on the Underground Railroad until 1861. Um, Judge Hugh Bown, um, he lives at or lived at that um, farmhouse that's in Oak Ridge Park. Um, probably built the Eastern Wing uh, for his library. Um, he is a, a Quaker, as was much of the family from Shubal to Hugh. Um, there were no slaves at Oak Ridge by the time he was the man of the house, although the house was actually owned by his mom. Um, but he was a very active politician. I, I have it all here. You know, he's Justice of the Peace. Uh, he was co-founder and mayor of Clark. 
um, delegate to the first and second uh, Republican National Convention. Um, does a lot. Um, the Quakers um, in the area are said to have been involved in the Underground Railroad. His cousin, um, George, uh, at Locust Grove, supposedly had a secret compartment in his basement. Um, Bound wouldn't have needed one, given the, as I know from first-hand experience, impenetrable swamp on his property. He and his uncle, that's George's father, um, they call for the emancipation of all the slaves at the um, New Jersey General Assembly. And going a step above a lot of uh, abolitionists at the time, he said everybody should be able to vote, um, regardless of skin color. Um, so he's hardcore. Uh, also worth mentioning, his cousins, second cousins in Queens, are known to have used their house as an underground railroad stop. Uh, you, can go, uh, you can go check it out, it's still there. There's a great society that runs it. Um, and lastly, Bound was one of the largest landholders in Rahway, uh, the other being his cousin George at Locust Grove. So he had more horses to spare if people were coming by in need of horses, fresh horses. Now this is get where it gets a little speculative, um, but there is some suspicious stuff. Um, we can't find out who Joseph Garrison is. Uh, I've looked through all the censuses. We can't find any trace of him. We wonder if he's perhaps an alias. Um, Reverend Oliver, he says his, uh, one of his main stopping places was the home of Garrett Smith outside of Syracuse. There are two routes the railroad took out of Syracuse and one was through Oswego. Oswego, has, or Oswego County has more underground railroad stops than any other county in the United States. Uh, Oswego is a port uh, between the United States and Canada, so it was very important for the railroad. Um, surprisingly, in 1835, our friend um, Hugh Bound winds up in Oswego. Um, he's on a boat, boat's in a storm, the captain does a great job getting out of the storm. So um, Judge Bound and several of the other passengers, uh, thrilled with their expert captain, um, write a put a petition together and it's published in a newspaper article. Um, interestingly, with Hugh Bound is a Peter Shotwell uh, from Rahway. Um, Peter Shotwell's second cousin is Benjamin Lundy, the guy who recruits uh, William Lloyd Garrison to the cause, um, perhaps if that is an alias, um, explaining where that came from. Um, yeah, so uh, a few other points to that. Um, Reverend Oliver also lists five others that uh, knew and used the same underground railroad, uh, underground railroad routes as him. Um, Dr. James Bias, William Still, who you might recognize as uh, working with Harriet Tubman, uh, Isaiah Ware, uh, Henry Highland Garnett, and David Paul Brown. Um, now, Reverend Garnett, known for his 1843 uh, call to rebellion speech, um, he did know Bounds cousins in Queens, the ones that had the Underground Railroad stop. He spoke at an event organized by them. Um, Garrett Smith also knew Bound's cousins in Queens um, and was affiliated with them. Um, so you might imagine uh, Reverend Garnett following the same route as Reverend Oliver. He would pass through Rahway. He would pass by Bound's house. He knows Bound's cousins. He knows Bound's got a lot of horses. He knows Bound's an abolitionist. He knows Bound has a Nice big swamp on his property. Um, so I bet money <laughs> that he might be tempted to ask Bound for help and use him at his house as a stop. Nothing proven. Uh, we are still digging. We're looking through a lot of letters um, between, you know, Reverend Garnett, uh, Garrett Smith, um, and he Bounds they might have known. Um, so still working on that. All right. Oof. Um, I'll just touch on this briefly. There's a big rock. Uh, glaciers push, push big rocks, and there is a big rock in the woods near where the slave cabin is. It's got a big, or had a big cleft. This is a more reading, recent picture where the cleft has broken off. Uh, but a big crack along the side. The family after Hugh, Hugh Bound dies, they're rich. They build their own train station in their backyard, um, as one does. Um, travelers to this train station would pass by this large rock, and they would put little messages in the crack um, to leave behind for anybody after them. Uh, and I think it's really poignant that uh, these travelers, these people going to the train station, to travel through space, they leave messages behind uh, for those after them. And now we're going to the site uh, to travel through time 
and you know what messages can we find so um i can go through that if anybody wants but um where are we at do we have time for tw questions it's exactly eight <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions? I'm sorry I flew. It's 13,000 years of history. Yes, sir. Oh, you have that Oak Ridge um, house. The thing to be done down the side in the future. It's been vacant for several years. Yes. So, um, I, I mentioned Bill Federski. He has been trying to preserve this site for uh, 30 years or more. Uh, it has been an uphill battle. The, the county doesn't uh, necessarily want to, um, at least historically but they have recently uh, started pursuing grant money to um, refurbish and restore uh, the house. Um, I know years ago, they paid the outside 10 years ago. Yeah, 2016, 2017. But yeah, no, they are pursuing money. There is a plan out there uh, to restore it. Um, they want to use it as an event space on the first floor, and I believe the second floor is to be county offices. Um, so we'll stay. We'll see, you know, we'll see if the, the money comes through. They're applying to the New Jersey Green Acres grant. Um, but uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a fight to, to get it safe. And it looks like we might actually be starting to get there. Yes, sir. Have you documented the, uh, the slave burial site? No, we, I, I've, we vaguely know probably where it was, um, but it has been, um, developed uh i think in the 70s i don't know bill if you recall that figure was it the 70s they probably approximately were under cheryl estates in uh, edison oh okay yeah um i also encourage everybody to read his uh application to the national register is online and he does it's it's amazing reading um he talks a lot more about the people who lived in the house the the tenant farmers um but yes no we haven't yet that is something we would like to do. We're probably gonna have to look at older maps, maybe topographical maps, maybe uh, LIDAR imagery if we can get it, maybe volunteers if they let us poke around. It's, it's on the agenda. Um, it's very important to us, um, but it's uh, a little bit more of uh, one of the larger challenges. Yeah. Yes, sir. Is the Robinsons that you mentioned in there related to the Robinson farmhouse that's on Madison Hill Road? That's a good question. Bill, can I defer to you for that one, too? <coughs> I don't know the, the Robinson house on Madison Hill Road, actually. Uh, the, it's a uh, Robinson Plantation, right? Yeah. No, no, no it's that, he's a Scottish doctor. Oh, okay, okay. No relation. Coincidence. <laughs> uh, earlier than the, than the Robinsons came to Oak Ridge. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Robinson family at Oak Ridge is like... Uh, late 1800s, and that that's going back to what the 1600s. The, yeah, yeah. He's been at this a lot longer than me. Uh, any other questions? Of interest, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, by through his association with the Bound family, mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln was actually a cousin of Judge Hughes Hartshorn Bound. Yeah. Yeah. So when when Bound went to the Republican conventions and, and Lincoln was eventually nominated, He's like I'm voting for my Bound cousin. would have been a part of that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. For yeah. some of the Edison people, while Thomas Edison, you know, was was you know at his place in Edison, he would t frequently take a horse and buggy up to, to the, the train station at Oak Ridge to pick up supplies and whatever. Mm. So he was actually fairly friendly with the family there and would visit uh, whenever he would come up to, you know, to, to pick up things at the, uh, the Ashbrook Station. Yeah, let me, um, if you want to follow the path, there actually is, where am I here? Oh, you can barely see it. Um, so this is where the station was. If you go up, there's a path on the left-hand side of the homestead that takes you basically straight there. There's a couple of telegraph poles on the, the left. So if you wanted to follow in the footsteps of Edison, you could go basically there and follow that straight path back to the homestead. Um, <laughs> as you can see, there's, there's so much to this one site. Uh, as, as Bill says, it, it has everything. Um, and it's, it's just a wonderful site. Um, we'd really love to see the, the county um, preserve and, and uh, educate about the, the history there. You know, markers, the, the works. Um, 
recreations. Um, there's a lot that could be done. Jeff, could I just point it out for the, from the, for the Rev War people here, the site is incredibly important because there are broadsides that were put out about atrocities that were, you know, you know directed uh, by the British and the Hessians, mm. you know, throughout the early part of the war. And as Washington was running from Brooklyn across the river and through New Jersey, uh, in order to get support for the locals, these broadsides were put out. Mm -hmm. And this site is important because the first broadside that was put out, it actually named Smith's Farm near Woodbridge and described, you know, the, the attack on the, on the Smith you know, family. That's, so, presumptively, the attack on Isabel Smith would have taken place in the left-hand portion of that house, which was the, part of the original farmstead. So, just to show how important it was, subsequent to the initial publications of the broadsides, there was a, 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 a paper put out by Dunlap in, out of Pennsylvania called Dunlap's uh, Pennsylvania Packet and General Advertiser. And if you go back to December 27, 1776, the account of the attack on the Smith family is on that front page, but the lead of that is... Thomas Paine's American Crisis Number One. Hmm. These are the times to try men's souls. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it, it is. So this site has national significance. Mm -hmm. Yep, through and through, from the get-go, um, from the beginning of our country, from the beginning of this site. It's it's remarkable how how many interconnections. Yeah, um, check that out. It's 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 fascinating. Um, but yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. In the 80s, they tore it down to be an Ashbrook Swing Club. Anybody remembers that? The big swing club, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. That was over in the... <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. It was torn down. That was a big house Oh, okay. It was torn down. I didn't know that one. Thank you. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's called Oak, Oak, Oak Bridge, uh, Ashbrook Swing Club. Mmm. Okay. It's a huge lot of land. Yeah, it's a, it's a shame. I mean, I think the the cabin has only survived by virtue of being in, you know, a thicker part of the swamp. Otherwise, it could be, you know, the houses encroach right on top of it. The the college encroaches right up to these Lenape sites um, and development is nipping away at the edges of all this. So it's really important to get it saved now. We're also worried about the water table increasing too. Um, we've seen a lot of evidence of that um, that could bury some of this. Did you have a question? Actually, well, I, I grew up like two houses away from the creek. Oh. That okay. ran next to, you know, the golf. We had the golf course at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as you went by, if you were traveling, at, I'm not good with directions, so that house is on your right. Uh -huh. And you kind of go around the bend and that's when you get to Ashbrook Swim Club. Right. But there was this old building there that was there for the longest time. It was brick and it was all covered with what one is that? Is that um, this? It might be. It might be because yeah. you, you didn't, it, you know, I remember it pretty covered with yeah, trees. Yeah, and, it is thick vines back there. Now, is that gone now? Yeah, that was the Fagan Cottage. Um, Bill tried to protect that as well in the register. Um, so it was there in the 90s. The, what the Fagan Cottage. The, the tenant farmers lived there. Oh, okay. It was built off-site, but they moved it there in around 1800. Um, they lived there, they were the farmers, um, the tenant farmers from the 50s, 1850s to 1890. Um, but yeah, they were there, they were there into the 20th century, right? Um, I remember, it pictures. looked abandoned, I remember, well, as yeah, a kid, but, yeah. you, you know, it was see, terrible, you know. This is the, the brick wall, this is their very unique beehive oven, um, that's down here. Okay. You can see a little pipe there. This is all that's left. That's some brickwork. There's that pipe that's there. It's okay. just a little mound of bricks. Um, it burnt down. Yeah. It, well, it was dilapidated. Nobody saved it. It yeah. burnt down. Yeah. And so now there's the brickwork from that wall, from their hearth, <coughs> um, their oven, and their well is back in the, the vines, too. Tricky to get to. But this you can see from the sidewalk, actually. If you look uh, just right, it's overgrown, but it's, it's there. 
Yeah. Yes. Before they start doing like you know improvements um, in that park, if they stumbled across something, mm -hmm. would that halt the improvement, or oh, how, no. how do you deal with things? I think it depends on what they find. Like if they find um, indigenous art artifacts, I believe they have to stop and do like an archaeological dig. Um, I don't know about more recent stuff. Would you happen to know, Bill, if they found like Revolutionary War stuff? The, um, One would hope. <laughs> the family who eventually owned the, the Beehive Oven House mm -hmm. had farmed the property and, and found a number of Indian artifacts on site. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when the county put up the, the, the running track, uh, the presumption is that they would have done some sort of archaeology, but uh, uh, apparently they found nothing. Um, yeah, they, they really said they found I know that artifacts, you know, basically, you know... <coughs> they carved up. Arrow and spear points have come off the property. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, I mean, this is where the Fagans found them, down here, by the um, archery range. Yeah, exactly. And then I believe uh, Grimstead mentioned stuff were found around uh, Pumpkin Patch. Brook. Yeah, Eleanor, but, Eleanor Warren's family owned 10 acres at, at that corner of the property. Yeah, yeah. And, and only because uh, Eleanor Warren's grandmother had, was a ward to the family and, and had grown up, grown up on the property. Mm. Yeah, so they've, they've pulled a lot out of the ground. Um, they, I've heard that up in the, the Ashbrook Reservation, like you can see, I haven't seen anything. Uh, I've been mostly just trying to hike through mud. But um, people have found just arrowheads laying on the paths up there. Um, so that's also why we want to, you know, get it protected. Um, and I haven't found anything. If I find anything, I would, I would um, either leave it there or um, hand it over to a local historical society or the, the college. Um, um, because, you know, it, it should be properly preserved. Um, the context is important too, like um, if you move stuff you might not know, okay, where exactly was this found, was it under anything, you, you lose the age, you lose the archaeological context. Um, so I haven't been, I, I, I took a golf ball I found, uh, <laughs> but aside from that I, I wouldn't, <laughs> I'm like that's the artifact I'll take, because um, it's funny, but um, yeah, no, I haven't found anything, but I haven't really looked for anything. Um, but if I, if anybody does happen to find anything, I would probably leave it. Um, if you do pick it up, take a picture and then bring it to, you know, either the historical society or a college, um, to, to preserve. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, technically illegal to keep, uh, Native American artifacts as well. Uh, so just be warned. Yeah. Just in case. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for coming again. Thank you. Thank you. There's my email. If anybody wants it, feel free to reach out, sign up on Facebook. Um, I'm happy to show anybody around the site too. Uh, just let me know. And there's some slides and brochures up there while supplies last. Oh, thank you.